Welcome everyone um, to Teaching Democracy, Reflective Patriotism for grades seven through 12. Thank you all for being here, um, some after a long day of work um, with an early start time. My name is Martha Madsen and I direct New Hampshire Civics. Um, Amanda Pollock is also here. She is our program manager. And um, I hope you will also peruse our website, nhcivics.org, if you have not already done so, and also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, for participating, you will receive two professional development hours. Um, they're available to you after this session, as well as a free copy of Annalisa Halverson's co-authored book, Reasoning with Democratic Values ethical issues in American history. Um, I hope that some of you will consider taking something that you learned today, applying it in your classroom, and then writing it up as a lesson plan or a unit. If you submit to us at New Hampshire Civics by May 1st, you will receive eight professional development hours and in addition, a $75 stipend. Um, and uh, many of those submissions um, eventually make it into our curriculum library on our website. I'm delighted today to introduce our presenters, all hailing from Michigan State University. I'm really thankful to them for the time and expertise that they have shared, that they have shared with us um, and that they will share with us um, as they have really taken time to design this engaging and relevant learning experience. First, um, welcome to Annalisa Halverson, who is an associate professor of teacher education at Michigan State. Her scholarship has focused on social studies education, the history of education, the integration of social studies into other subject areas and curriculum policy, among other topics. Her current work focuses on elementary social studies, project-based learning and historical thinking. She is a former kindergarten teacher and has co-authored the book, Reasoning with Democratic Values, Ethical Issues in American History. Um, next, we welcome Dr. Jane Lowe, um, who is assistant professor of teacher education at, also at Michigan State. Her research focuses on civics education, political engagement of youth, and curriculum development. She teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in social studies methods. Um, prior to becoming a teacher educator, Dr. Lowe taught government, economics, and Chinese in Austin, Texas. Al Wood is joining us today also. He's a doctoral student in curriculum instruction and teacher education at Michigan State University. Prior to his graduate studies, Mr. Wood taught middle and high school social studies for nine years in rural Northern Arizona, including three years teaching on the Navajo Nation. His research goal is to increase awareness of the unique challenges faced by social studies teachers in rural communities. Um, so relevant to many New Hampshire teachers, he's interested in how rural students can be engaged in the political process. So welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Martha, for the welcome and the introduction and everybody, thanks for having us here. Um, without much further ado, I kind of want to get us started so that you get all the kinds of things that you need. Um, really quickly, I just want to go over the agenda of things that we're going to be doing tonight. Um, obviously, we'll do quick introductions really quickly here. Um, and then we want to hear from you a little bit more about your goals and questions and challenges and kind of what brought you to the session tonight. And since there's only a few of us here at the time, um, we might actually ask you to speak a little bit. Uh, hopefully that's okay. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about discussion facilitation and what that actually looks like and what are some good practices um, that you can do in your own classroom. And then of course, Alisa is going to share um, a great deal about reasoning with democratic value, what it is, some examples and things that you can take away um, for you to hopefully do either this week or next week in your classes. And then we'll also spend some time just sharing some resources and then go back to kind of your questions and goals 
and then talk about maybe some things that you might try on Monday. And I, I know two hours is a long time, so hopefully we'll be able to build in a little bit of a break about halfway through so that everyone can kind of stretch it and, and do whatever we need to do. Um, and then also in terms of questions, you know, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we're pretty informal here. And if you need to also just interrupt us, that's OK, too. Like I said, it's a small group. So please, if you have questions, don't hesitate to, to just ask and pop um, pop in. All right. So um, with that, I will hand it off to Annalisa to get us started with introductions. Great. Thanks, Jane. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. We know after a long day, joining and sitting on the two hours of Zoom is, is a is a big commitment. So thank you for doing this. But we're so like Jane said, Jane and Al and I are so excited to talk with you all. It's so exciting to talk to somebody outside of Michigan, you know, and just to, to, we're excited to learn from you as well as to hopefully share some ideas. Um, so as Martha mentioned, I'm a former kindergarten teacher. I also have done a lot of work with curriculum writing. I love writing curriculum um, at all at all levels. Um, I've been at Michigan State for 15 years. Um, and I've taught a range of courses in both elementary literacies and elementary social studies. So um, I, you know, as Martha mentioned, I do a lot with integration. And so um, we feel like social studies is stronger with literacy, literacy is stronger with, stronger with social studies. So I've been able to teach both those classes. Um, even though East, uh, Michigan State is in East Lansing, I live in the city of Detroit and I have three children um, who often become sort of my sounding boards for ideas that I want to try in the classroom. So I have a third grader as Fifth, a sixth grader and a seventh grader. Um, and they are in school after 535 days. They are back in school. So not that I was counting, but they are back. So uh, that you might end up seeing one at some point tonight. Um, and then, you know, I focus on social studies, uh, elementary and secondary curriculum reform, history of elementary social studies. I do a lot of work with project-based learning because I'm really interested in like, how can we get kids to see the value of what they're learning and the application of what they're learning to context beyond school. We've seen firsthand the engagement um, that kids have when they're actually learning something that has relevance beyond the schoolhouse walls. So that's the work I've been involved in most recently. Um, and a little bit with discussion of public issues and of course, reasoning with democratic values, which I'll share about later tonight. Thanks, and I'm gonna hand it off to Jane. Thanks, Annalisa. And so just a little bit more about myself. Um, I went with photos here. Hopefully that's a good way to kind of represent who I am. Um, on the top right here, you actually see photos of students working on a project. And that's because, um, as Martha mentioned, I used to be a high school teacher. And a lot of the work that I did actually in my dissertation has to do with project-based learning in the high school setting, especially in AP social studies courses. And so that's sort of where I cut my teeth as a researcher, so to speak. On the bottom left there, you see a lot of kids' books, because right now I'm actually focusing on teaching elementary social studies in the methods classes and training teachers who want to become elementary teachers. And so I'm always thinking about that nexus of how we can get kids to think about social studies in important ways, even when they're um, uh, quite young to do so. And then, of course, in the College of Education there in Michigan State, you see that um, it's up there because this is actually only my second year at MSU, so I'm still getting used to the snow. I know that snow is a thing here, so <laughs> we'll see how this one goes. Um, and then the other thing you see some it's like chat boxes and talking boxes right under my name. Um, and that's because I, I'm super interested in how we and children kind of talk, talk about things that are different and sharing our different perspectives. Um, and I actually have a co-edited or not co-edited, edited book that's coming out in January um, on making discussions work in social studies classroom. And I'll share that link later on today uh, if that becomes a resource that could help you. And that's me. So I will pass it on to Al. Hi, everyone. It's exciting to be able to be here and share my experiences with you. So thank you so much for having me. My name is Al Wood, and I am a first year doctoral student at Michigan State University in our curriculum instruction and teacher education program. Before coming to Michigan State, I was a social studies teacher for nine years in two different districts in rural northern Arizona. And the fun thing about teaching in rural school districts is you get to teach everything. So for the last six years of my experience, I was the only social studies teacher in the entire district. So I taught everything from sixth grade ancient civilizations all the way up to senior government and economics and everything in between, including a stint with AP US history and AP government politics. So um, I have t dipped my toes in the water, so to say, in just about everything social studies related. Um, I did also teach for three years and student taught on the Navajo Nation, which has really shaped my perspective about 
not only the history of indigenous education in the United States, but also just my experiences as a learner compared to the experiences of other learners that we may have in our classrooms. So right now as a doctoral student, I have shifted from teaching K-12 to teaching undergraduate teacher candidates, you know, student teachers, so to say. So I co-teach a course on social studies methods for undergraduates. And then I supervise a handful of student teaching interns in their placements as well. And given all of my experiences in rural classrooms, my research focus is really on how do students in rural classrooms receive social studies? How do they perceive social studies? How do social studies teachers teach in rural communities? How is that different from other spaces? Um, and how is critical and social justice pedagogy is received and experienced in rural communities? And how can we as rural social studies teachers increase political efficacy among our students? So that's me. Now that you heard from all of us, we would love to find out a little bit more about you. And we had uh, originally thought about doing this waterfall activity um, where you could, um, you know, put in your name and information into the chat. But since there are only a few of us here, it would actually be really great to hear from you. Um, and so, and if, of course, if you're not in a place where that you could do that, please feel free to also share this information in the chat. But it would be great to just kind of go down the list um, and hear from you all, sort of provide your name, uh, where your city or school that you teach in, and then something you're excited about teaching this year. Peggy, you want to go first? <laughs> sure, I can go first. Um, I'm Peggy Frostholm. I teach at Pembroke Academy in Pembroke, New Hampshire. Um, and this is the beginning of year four there, um, my 24th, 25th year of teaching. Um, and something I'm excited about teaching this year, I'm actually part of uh, what we're calling a school within a school. We call it Innovation Academy. Um, it is student directed, student uh, led, and it is really all the disciplines all together. Um, and that's something that I get very excited about teaching. This is our second year running Innovation Academy. Um, and it's something I get very excited about just because it's, it has so many opportunities for the kids to explore what they're really interested in and for me to really challenge myself in trying to integrate social studies into whatever it is that they're learning about. Um, so it's, it's very exciting for me to be part of that every year. And I'm really looking forward to that expanding more this year. Thank you so much, Peggy. Sarah, I think I see you unmuted, so. Yep. Um, I would love to hear more about Peggy's program. That sounds amazing. Um, I'm teaching at Keene High School in Southwestern New Hampshire, and I teach mainly civics, economics. I also have standalone economics and a standalone political science class. Um, one thing that I'm excited about being a part of the We Are America cohort that has taken off from a school in Lowell, Mass. And so it just, the curriculum lends itself beautifully to the civics curriculum that we've created at our school. And so I'm taking one course through it and they're gonna be able to publish stories about what does it mean to be an American? And, and you, we're using, I'm using the curriculum to kind of shape you know, their, their identity and how they perceive themselves in the greater world as a civic community contributor. So I'm really excited about being a part of that cohort this year and hopefully being able to do it again. That just sounds amazing, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Fred or Doug hate cold calling people, but um, would either of you like to share? No worries, Fred. Thank you so much for sharing the chat. Um, yeah, I can share. Uh, sorry, I don't have my video on, just not in a place to do that. Um, I am uh, teaching uh, at the Beach Hill School. My, I'm teaching uh, middle school, uh, actually for the first time, uh, in uh, Hopkinton, New Hampshire. Um, I am very excited, actually, to be teaching geography to sixth graders for the very first time. It's a different age group, um, a different subject, something that um, excites me, um, especially after uh, doing just 
some fun reading for myself this summer to, in preparation, um, specifically reading uh, Prisoners of Geography, um, which is a great book if you haven't had a chance to check it out. Uh, but a uh, but I'm really excited about teaching that subject as well as U.S. history and uh, more of a modern world history. Thank you so much, Doug, and thanks for sharing the chat, Fred. It's so great to hear from all of you and to kind of know who you all are and um, just to looking forward to hearing from your experiences throughout the rest of the session as well. Um, and so this next activity is, again, it's a check-in. And in case you've not done a Padlet before, it's a great way to kind of just get solicit um, student thinking and things of that nature. But obviously, with um, the few of number that we have here, we don't have to necessarily put things into the Padlet. But it is a great way to just for you to think through um, kind of what brought you here today and also any challenges and questions that you might have. And so um, let's take a couple of minutes to go ahead. I put the link there in the chat for those of you who can't access it. Um, but for those of you that can't see it, the link basically says, goals for the session as one bucket, challenges that you face, and then questions that you have as the three general topics. I'm going to take a couple of minutes. If you have multiple questions, just keep clicking on the add, um, add sign there, and you can add multiple questions, multiple challenges, um, and multiple goals there. And if you don't have access to Padlet, that's okay too, and want to put either your goals, challenges, or questions in the chat, that's fine, or even feel free to share um, with everybody through um, talking, that would be great too. So I'll just give everybody a couple minutes to do that. I don't know if anybody else is having trouble um, writing on the Padlet. Um, I just was uh, um, when I when I accessed the link, um, I didn't have the plus on it. I don't know if I need to sign in or something. Apologies so. for that. Um, it I might be it might be too much trouble to try to troubleshoot at this juncture, I apologize. And so maybe if you had a question or a challenge, maybe share with us just here, you know, audially or through the chat, that would be great. Doug, thanks Technology for Technology doesn't I'm... always I work the way I... we want it to. Right. And poor Jade, we're making Jane do all this because she's such a, she's so good with the technology. But Doug, thanks for sharing that about middle schoolers. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. And that, I think that's the hardest age to teach. So. <laughs> Definitely. I'm curious, does anybody have any challenges that you feel like you're facing or any um, things that you wish you knew more about? I have, uh, this is Sarah, I have one, well, uh, I guess they're kind of married, you know, working. And I know that um, Al talked a little bit about rural and where I am in southwestern New Hampshire isn't really truly that rural compared to other areas. However, we have a lot of, you know, more conservative families that come to our school and, and the kids come in with this preconceived idea of, 
you know, I'm, my voice isn't going to be valued. And so they come in with this chip on their shoulder and aren't really ready to engage and learn, even though I strive to make my classroom open and, and flexible and we're all going to, you know, respect each other's ideas and, and just really trying to break through those barriers takes a lot of time. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm already halfway through the semester trying to, you know, figure out how to, how to really get some of these kids in, even though, you know, I work really hard every day trying to show them that, you know, they're safe and it's okay to disagree and it's okay to have different opinions and your all your voices are valued and it's okay to be conservative. But a lot of these kids just really feel like they're overshadowed by the liberal kids and they can't share their ideas or they come in and they just aren't willing to listen to anybody else's ideas. So that's a struggle that I'm facing. Thanks for sharing that, Sarah. Um, Peggy, you have something else to share? Yeah, I was really going to say pretty much what Sarah was just saying. Um, my district is, interestingly enough, we sit right next door to the capital, to Concord. We're the next town over. Um, and my district has five towns in it. And it's actually pretty rural, which is really interesting being right next door to Concord. Um, but it's also, it's a mix, I would say, of liberal and conservative. But it's, I kind of face the same issues that Sarah faces that my conservative kids tend to believe that they're going to be overshadowed by the liberal kids. And I really want to help them understand that all voices are valued and try to honor everyone's contributions um, in a way that doesn't allow one group or the other to sort of take over the classroom. Um, but at the same time, I, I, you know, it's the same, almost exactly the same challenge that Sarah, you were talking about is I want all my students to know that it's safe to express their opinion and it's safe to have an opinion. Um, and yet at the same time, kind of challenge their preconceived notions in some ways um, on both ends of the spectrum. So it's, it's a balancing act. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, and it's definitely something that we'll talk a bit more about uh, today, obviously, when we're talking about discussion and reason with that. Um, just noting also, uh, Doug shared very similar things. And then Fred also talking about framing and democracy being messy um, and requires a kind of confrontation that requires a lot of listening without judgment. I, I really love that framing, um, Fred. So yes, absolutely. Those are all things we will talk a little bit more about today. Um, speaking of, it's like the perfect segue. So um, Annalisa, would you like to take this one? Yeah, thank you. And I just have to say, I really appreciate the challenges that you all raised. And one of the things I'm going to emphasize um, when we a little bit later on the session when we talk about the book is that the book actually asks kids to weigh in on particular issues um, in, in their US history. And what's interesting about them is that it's because they're from history and because they're about individuals, it's, it's not always clear what's the liberal and what's the um, conservative perspective. And so it actually, I'm hoping that um, if, if you decide to use any of the chapters in the book, you might actually find that you hear different kinds of voices. You know, it's some of them it's about sort of religious freedom, which can really be argued from different perspectives. Um, and, and, you know, so, and because they're from history, you know, from long ago, most of them are from long ago, um, kids that distance might sort of help them, you know, sort of take away a little bit of the emotionality of something that's contemporary. So um, I, I really appreciate that. And I also think these kids are so lucky to have all of you as teachers, you know, that, um, that you really value all voices and, and express that. And I think that's just that's really powerful and even if they're not expressing that um, to you it's um it's really i think it's amazing um and so we wanted to you know we're from michigan and um you know we we really understand the importance of and of place and space and so we want to recognize we don't know your your environment we don't know your state um the ways that you do but we're learning and we wanted to just let you know that we took a look at the New Hampshire um, civic standards. Um, we looked at all the standards actually in history and geography and world history. And because we wanted to see, you know, to what degree is New Hampshire different or similar from Michigan? And there's a lot of overlap. And so once we just wanted to make sure what we were talking about today wasn't something that was like really um, radically different from the kinds of things you were teaching. And so we wanted to let you know, we did take a look at those standards. Um, Michigan has gone through its own standards revision process. Talk about messy, whoever was saying, I think Fred was saying that messy. Oh my gosh, that was such a messy, messy, difficult experience. But we have our new standards. Um, 
but we know your standards were written in 2006, um, but there's still, even with the time difference, we know that there's, there's a lot of um, similarities in terms of content coverage and skills. The other thing though, that is different, we wanted to emphasize is that we know that you have this legislation broadly framed, we're calling it, people are sort of calling it anti-critical race theory legislation. Of course, it looks different across different states. There's proposed legislation like that in Michigan right now. So we're very aware of this. And we actually thought it would be really helpful just to even take a look at what is in the language, you know? And cause we thought, you know, we don't wanna recommend anything today um, that is going to, you know, get teachers in trouble and and have UV violating this. And so we actually, we wanted to take a look and see like, you know, what what is in the law. Um, and so we, you know, we're not gonna go through it all right now, but, um, you know, when we look at all of these um, sort of A, B, C, D, and E and so forth, they're talking a lot about individuals. Um, and nothing that we're gonna talk about today, you know, implies that any one individual is, you know, sort of inherently racist or sexist or oppressive and, 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 and so forth. And everything today, most of what we're going to talk about today is um, some of it's contemporary, but also a lot of it's historical too. And so we know historically that there has been oppression in this country and there has systematically. So a lot of what we're going to do is talk about sort of s systematic approaches as opposed to talking about individuals. And we by no means want any child in the classroom to sort of feel as if, you know, they are being singled out, um, you know, whatever their race, whatever their background. Um, but we don't, nothing that is in here we saw is in conflict with what we're teaching. And when we feel like teaching about things like white uh, supremacy and oppression, those aren't in conflict with what's in here because we're talking about systems, you know, as a, talking about in, individuals. So um, we just wanted to give a little bit of that background. And we have been in touch too with Martha about, you know, really to what degree is this impacting, you know, what you're teaching. Um, and um, we know it's a really, it's a really hard time to be a social studies teacher. Um, and so we just also wanted to acknowledge that. Great. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, leading discussion and just how you know critical it is to civic education. We have a couple slides on this. Um, Jane and I are going to tag team on this. Um, but we really do feel like you know, we love discussing. All three of us love discussing. You know, I mean, when, when we're not teaching about discussing discussion, we're probably discussing another issue. You know, and so it is really critical. You become better the more you talk. And so you know, I'm thinking about these the students um, who are self-identifying as conservative in your classrooms, like they, they actually need those opportunities to discuss, like they will be, you know, better citizens, they will be more effective if they have those opportunities. So we really, you know, I'm very mindful of, um, you know, really making sure that all voices, you know, have an opportunity to um, be expressed in a classroom. One of my proudest moments as a social studies methods instructor was um, in 2003, a long time ago, when we were teaching about, um, I was teaching social studies methods and we were talking about the war in Iraq and um, you know, I, I bent over backwards not to sort of express my viewpoint. And then one of the students happened to come by my house and drop something off and she saw my <laughs> anti-war sign in my yard and she's like, I never would have known. <laughs> so I was like, okay, good. Well, that's, you know, that's probably good that I was sort of trying to be, you know, balanced here, but, you know, you know, we're, we can't always be neutral as teachers either, you know, and certainly there's some things that we do really, you know, want to not to be neutral about. Um, but there are a lot of public issues that we really want students to hear from multiple perspectives and to be able to, they'll get better if they hear from different perspectives. So I just love this quote, students, particularly at the kindergarten through 12th grade level are responsible for helping turn students into well-informed and discerning citizens. At their best, our nation's schools equip young minds to grapple with complexity and navigate our differences. At worst, they resemble in indoctrination factories. And that's, we feel like that's exactly what we don't want to do. We really want kids to be thinking about themselves. Issues are going to change, right? You know, but those skills will maintain with them throughout their lives. And so um, we want them to be able to apply those skills to different, you know, many, many different issues that will come up in their lifetime. And we really feel schools are the place to do this. Um, that's where, that's where the students are. That's where the teachers are. That's where kids can actually engage in these discussions with an expert teacher in the room who can facilitate that. Um, and so we really want to emphasize just the power and importance of this and have, and students really love it too. They really like opportunities to exchange ideas. Um, the inclusion of controversy can communicate the essence of what makes communities democratic. And it also helps skills uh, build the skills and dispositions young people need. And so 
what some people think of as, as controversial might be different from what other people think of, but like we do want kids engaged in that um, and being able to value and hear different perspectives. And finally, talking together across differences is critical to the health of a democracy. We're, we're often, we often agree on the end goals for what we want in a society, but we disagree in the means to get there. And so it's really important for us to, you know, talk together to see what kind of common, you know, um, viewpoints we have and see also where we disagree. Um, but, you know, those, those things are just really, really important um, in, in a classroom. Um, and then just a few tips on what I found in my work. I've done a lot of work with um, my colleagues, Margaret Krakow and Abner Siegel and Rebecca Jacobson on facilitating discussion. We actually did a study where we looked at um, you know, how um, kids use evidence in discussions or how they don't use evidence in discussions because we know kids you know, oftentimes just have opinions and they wanna bring those opinion, opinions in, but we were really studying the ways in which they drew upon evidence. And, um, and in this, we found a lot of, a lot, we had a lot of takeaways. Um, we learned that it's really important to vary the format for facilitating discussion. Um, so we've done a lot with like fish bowls and uh, sort of online discussions, pairs discussions, just varying that format rather than the large group discussion because that's really intimidating. Um, with when I work with elementary kids, I often will have um, signs around the room and say like, if you agree with this, go to the side of the north side of the room. If you disagree, go to the south side of the room and actually physically move, you know, to do that. Um, and so just varying it and, you know, having a just diverse way of um, engaging in students in discussion um, is really important. Um, another thing I've found really effective is going beyond the pro and con or the yes or no is actually um, really sort of looking at the nuances of this, of discussions, and maybe even looking for, you know, a deliberation in terms of like coming to coming to a consensus, like how could we solve this problem? We have this problem in our community. What are ways we can agree on to address this problem? Um, and so pros and cons can oftentimes, especially those who are talking about sort of your liberal versus conservative students, you know, sometimes it's actually good to find a different kind of issue that will um, help them see that actually they see eye to eye. And so, you know, thinking about, rather than thinking like, oh, should vaccines be mandated? Yes or no, like what about like, how can we create a community where everyone feels safe, is safe? And so, you know, we can all agree on that. And so, you know, how can we talk about how to get there? So going beyond the pro and con can be helpful. Um, and then and I'm sure this is what you all do as teachers, but just then and experienced teachers, especially being an active facilitator, like the, your role as a teacher is really, really critical. Um, and I love, I think it was um, Peggy talking about um, the, um, uh, student-led, you know, um, discussions and students do a great job facilitating themselves, but like teachers, it's really important to have a teacher in there to help redirect, make sure that children are, you know, sharing the air, um, that, you know, when it gets too heated, you know, we can take a step back, reminding them of the ground rules and so forth. So, um, you know, when we talk later on in the session about facilitating discussion, we really want to emphasize that Importance of the teacher, that teacher playing an active, active role in it. And I think all of you are experienced, I'd love to hear from you too um, about what you do that you find effective. Um, and then tips for facilitating discussion, a few more. Um, and I think Al's going to give some examples of this later on in the talk too. But, um, you know, just the importance of that classroom community and building trust. Um, I think some of you are talking about being, you know, seven, eight years or seven, seven, eight, eight weeks into the semester. Uh, you know, and it, it does take time, like it really does take time to foster that, that space where people, um, you know, can trust each other and, um, and value those perspectives. And so, um, you know, it's, it's easier said than done, but we found that, you know, establishing that classroom community and even a classroom community, you know, beyond the classroom with the families too, you know, whenever I'm bringing up a controversial topic in the classroom, I find that like letting my parents, students' parents know ahead of time um, can sometimes stave off some kind of challenges there. Um, having students be involved in the ground rules is, is great because uh, we know students have opinions, they have ideas themselves, and actually I think they're going to have more ownership if they can come up with what should be these rules that we are going to be following. Um, selecting topics carefully with a student interest in mind. And th this, I'll just tell you a quick anecdote. This is so important because it, we totally fell flat in our research study. We did a, um, this was 2015, and we did a topic where it was like whether or not um, uh, Facebook, like inter the, the uh, internet surveillance, you know, and like 
you know, how much should the internet, you know, meet social media be, you know, observing your moves and so forth. This was before Facebook and all the problems with Cambridge Analytica. Anyway, they, they could care less. They didn't care. They were like, well, I don't care if they, they track, you know, what I do and what I like, you know, it can be helpful sometimes when I get these targeted ads, you know, <laughs> it's just, so it was clear that we really missed the mark on this. We picked a topic that they, they didn't disagree on. Nobody disagreed on. They were all fine with it, you know? So just thinking about sort of testing the waters with students first is really important. And then the last thing is just sort of easing slowly into those classrooms discussions. And that's what I've sort of talking about earlier about varying the format, you know, like small group pairs, you know, having them feel a little bit more confident by sharing ideas with one or two people before, you know, jumping into the whole group can, um, can just, you know, sort of help the discussion be more engaging, but then also kids feel more confident. Yeah, and for sure, as Annalisa is talking about kind of ways to think about facilitating discussion, I think one of the ways to help especially high school students and older students really think about how to open up and have these discussions, really framing things as part of reflective patriotism. Um, and this term, Annalisa will talk a little bit more about too when she start talking about reasoning with democratic values. But um, this quote that we have lifted here is from the Educating for American Democracy document that just came out um, the end of last year and earlier this year. Um, and basically, you can probably read through the actual definition there. But this notion of framing history and framing the learning about government and all of these things, not as um, things that are already set in stone, but that things that students can actually engage actively with. And so I, we find that framing it as reflective patriotism really, really helps because it helps students think about how can I appreciate all of the ideals and the things that went into the founding of this country and what we're trying to do, but at the same time, hold together with that appreciation, sort of a critique, right? Uh, a, a candid reckoning of, as the, as the phrase says there, with the ways in which we've not lived up to the ideals and the values that we've had. And it's a great kind of opening to get students to think about in what ways are these ideals that we, we still strive towards and in what ways have we kind of fallen short of those ideals. Um, and that's kind of one way to frame, you know, a government class or US history class around this notion of reflective patriotism that can really help students to really think about what, what does it mean to actually have different opinions, right? About, I think kids can have different, they know because of social media and things, it's easy to have different opinion on really hot topic issues or on specific um, things that they might see on social media. But, you know, trying to help them ground and frame things about, well, what other kinds of things that aren't hot topic issues necessarily, but just kind of the, the ways in which we think about our ideals of how to live well together. Um, we find that in research, people actually have a lot more agreement on those things. I think Annalisa said earlier, the ends are pretty, very much similar. People just have very different ideals about the means of getting there. And so helping students think about learning history or government content or civics content as part of this notion of reflective patriotism can really help foster some of those conversations. Yeah, and we've been really thinking a lot about this term reflective patriotism because we feel like there's it's a it's a way of being critical you know like that we you can love your country we can love our country um, but we can also be critical of decisions and so um i just found this quotation um i think this was in the atlantic um and it was about um a president obama's from a speech he gave um and he and obama talked about this sort of this new way of looking at american exceptionalism which we know we talk about when we teach us history um, and it was sort of like a critical American exceptionalism. He, he said, I'm here to tell you that yes, we still have more work to do, more work to do for every American still in need of a good job or a raise, paid leave or a decent retirement, for every child who needs a sturdier ladder out of poverty or a world-class education, for everyone who hasn't yet felt the progress of these past seven and a half years. We need to keep making our streets safer and our criminal justice fair, our homeland more secure and our world more peaceful and sustainable for the next generation. We're not done perfecting our union or living up to our founding creed that all of us are created equal and free in the eyes of God. And, um, you know, I just thought that was a really interesting quote for kids to think about because it's, you know, it's about, um, you know, loving your country and holding your country up to high standards, 
but also recognizing that it's on it's it's progress right and we're not there yet we you know we still have you know systemic oppression and racism and huge problems and hunger um and so it's it's about you know sort of being proud of you know what has been accomplished and the fact that we can disagree on how to get there um but then you know recognizing still that there's there's a, you know still room to room to grow and um things to improve um and so you'll see later on when we talk about the book there is um patriotism is actually not one of the uh, core democratic values in it but you'll see that there's sort of loyalty and promise keeping are and liberty and equality they're mentioned there and because they're all sort of subsumed under the notion of you know being being a patriot so we um we just really liked i think martha helped us think about this too this idea of you know what does it mean to be um you know reflective um you know, had to have reflective patriotism and so we just wanted to sort of highlight this as, as a theme to think about throughout this session and then, of course, if you are going to engage students in this kind of reflective patriotism and the kinds of discussion that you all were talking about doing, um, conflict is bound to happen. And sometimes in high school, especially if kids have had years of learning how to avoid conflict, you actually might not get that conflict. And so a couple of tips in terms of thinking about how do you even talk about controversial things or difficult topics. Um, one thing is kind of what Sarah was talking about, really, um, helping your students understand, and it might take a little bit, but to help them understand conflict actually is okay. Conflict is a normal part of life and that that conflict is okay, but that means that we have to create a really safe space in our classrooms for them to then feel like experiencing that conflict won't um, harm them in a detrimental way, right? So those two things go hand in hand, creating that safe space, which I was going to talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, but that helping students understand conflict is actually okay. Um, and the one thing that we never go away from is honoring well-reasoned ideas, as Annalisa talked about earlier, right? Having kids think about what evidence they're using and how they're reasoning with that evidence is always, always important, uh, no matter what topic, but especially when you're talking about difficult topics or controversial issues. Um, and then these next few things are really things that we want students to just learn to be in terms of better human beings, right? And so that is respond with generosity and fairness. So learning what that looks like. Um, and again, if you have students who've had schooling for a long time and they might not think things are fair or things people haven't been generous, it takes a lot of time to kind of unlearn that in a, in a very safe environment to be able to have them trust um, that people can be generous again. And then of course, practicing forgiveness because because when we talk about difficult topics, we're bound to step on toes and say the wrong things. And again, creating that safe environment in the classroom is going to help everybody practice what it means to, to ask for forgiveness and to forgive one another in that community. And then of course, be respectful and help your students ask good questions. And, and I would just say that the best way to help do all of these things or help your students do all of these things is actually to model it. And so that is a big ask for even adults, right? Um, but that we have to be generous and we have to be fair and we have to we have to forgive um, and we have to be respectful and we have to show kids that conflict is actually okay and how do we how do we get out of that and so as Anlisa said earlier the more we practice this um, the better the better we get and then the better students can get at some of this um, and then how do we do that well, some of these things, as I said, is starting out with the right classroom environment. So previous slide about setting up all of those things, and Al will talk about that next. Um, but also creating a routine for talking and listening in class. Like, are we practicing that? Are we taking time in our class to say, hey, for the next 10, 15 minutes, we're going to practice. We're going to practice talking. We're going to practice listening and see what that looks like. And then building that trust, because the thing that Sarah was mentioning, that's still so hard to do still. Um, and some of it is modeling as adults, like of doing that internal work for myself. Who am I as a teacher? What privileges do I own? Am I asking my students to show up in ways that I'm actually not showing up? Am I asking for them to be vulnerable when I'm not being vulnerable? Right, those kinds of things, modeling for them that you are you are also being genuine. You are trusting them as much as they should trust you and one another. Um, and then of course, gauging your own level of comfort and discomfort and having students do this. Like there are things that as an adult, like I don't feel comfortable 
talking about. And that, that's okay. And knowing where those lines are. And to Annalisa's earlier point, so students can develop the rules, right? They can know where those hard lines are and what things you don't discuss because we, we all have those kind of comfort and discomfort levels. Um, and then of course, building community ground rule thing we already talked about and humanizing experiences that just means that really we we view one another as valuable human beings not not because of what we bring to the table but just inherently um, we all have value and so no matter what we say no matter what uh, snafus we you know and what uh, what kinds of things that we are how we offend people maybe even in the room right that we still have that inherent value and that that's the only way we can practice again learning to ask for forgiveness and to forgive and to build those genuine emotional um, connections and then prioritizing social and emotional well-being um, is all of the things that i've basically been talking about and i know it's easy to to talk through a list and it's really really hard work so i want to just lift that up and recognize that it's work that I try to do still in my classroom, I know Annalisa tries to do, and I'm sure Al does as well, as he will show in a minute, but um, it's something that we hope you can see we are all in this together. Um, this is definitely not something that we're telling you to do. This is something we are also trying to do ourselves, and we just want to encourage you to also try out these things and work towards these things. So speaking of examples. Thank you, Jane. So. I want to just take a second and reflect on what Jane just got done talking about, how we're all kind of doing this as a work in progress. This is not something that any one of us has, so to say, perfected. This is something, these skills that Anaway saying Jane are talking about are things that we as teachers continue to build upon and polish and perfect, not only as we gain experience as teachers, but also with each changing year, each new dynamic of students we get each semester or each year, we have to go back and fine tune some of our approaches a little bit. So what I want to take a minute to do is reflect upon some of the things Anaway saying Jane have kind of shared with us us in terms of reflective patriotism, strategies for facilitating discussion in our classrooms, ways for approaching controversial issues or difficult history. And I want to just kind of share with you some of the strategies I've used as a classroom teacher to do my best to integrate these things in, in my classroom, acknowledging, of course, that context matters, that it, different schools are going to call for different things, different communities are going to have different needs. And whenever I participated in professional development as a teacher, I was always the teacher that went into a PD, took ideas and adapted them for myself. So the things that I share with you may not work perfectly in your settings, but you might be able to take some, some of the things I share and you might be able to apply them, do some modifications and make them your own. So the first thing I will say is that building community is essential. Finding a way, taking the time, the icebreakers, the team building activities to show students that your classroom is a safe space for being able to share candid opinions about where your students are at on different issues. It's an investment that's worth making up front. And I was actually just having this conversation with one of my pre-service teachers earlier today that sometimes some of these team building icebreaker activities that we do as teachers seem, so the, the term they used was fluff, because it's not teaching the hard content, right? It's, it's going around and it's creating a community among your students. And I come from the position of that's an investment that you make at the beginning of the year and you reiterate as the year goes on, because if you take the time early on to establish a community in your classroom, you're then more able to have some of those more difficult conversations as time goes on. And as Sarah said, definitely building equity with the kids and showing students that we're all in this together, that you as a teacher are kind of in the same boat in terms of learning, modifying your own opinions as time goes along. So you may be asking yourselves, how do I do this? How do I create community in my classroom? Again, completely context dependent. If sometimes school districts, sometimes schools have canned programs that they, all of the teachers, all of the school 
endorses and kind of participates in to build community on a school-wide basis. And if that's the case, definitely buy into those programs, definitely endorse those programs and show students that those programs are valid. Where I went to, where I taught last, we had a program called Capturing Kids Hearts, where our goal was to capture our students' hearts, literally, because if we did not have a student's heart, we could not capture their minds. That was the way the saying went. Um, one way that that manifested in my classroom is I started off the year by creating a social contract with my students. And if you think about, you know, philosophy, world history, the Enlightenment, John Locke, a social contract is this idea of why we have a government, right? We have a government so that we are protected from more or less social Darwinism. We have government so that we have to give up a certain amount of our freedom, but in exchange, so does everyone else. And we're protected and everyone else is protected. And in the social contract, we, we sat down with students in the first week of school and we said, okay, how do you want to be treated by each other? How do you want to be treated by your teachers? And we just wrote down a list of adverbs that kind of described, I want to be treated this way. I want to be treated this way. And we as a class kind of voted on, okay, these are the terms that our interactions are going to be based off of. And we all signed this contract, kind of like a poster, and we hung it on the wall. And as time went on, if we needed to refer back to our social contract to remind ourselves how we should be you know, engaging in discussion with one another, that was right there hung on the wall. And students bought into that. Students were part of the decision-making process that was not like a poster of rules handed down by the teacher. It was something that students actually bought into and helped to construct and facilitate. So I'm arguing that com building community is key in your classroom for three reasons. For one, it allows you to facilitate productive student participation on controversial issues or difficult history. And dis facilitating discussions, as both Jan and Annalisa discussed, it takes, takes some practice. It takes some getting used to, not only from the teacher standpoint, but also from students being able to trust one another. And I wanna take a second and kind of use the whiteboard here to share with you all kind of how I went about doing this. So when I led discussions, on a topic. I started by giving students a couple of articles to read, to mark up, to annotate a night or two nights before. And on, on, on an open question that was relevant to the content I was teaching either in US history or in government or economics or whatever. And that way students walked in the door with some background knowledge, even if they didn't read the articles perfectly, even if they just skimmed them, they at least had a sense of some different points of view, some different perspectives. Then when I did that, I, let's see, I then ended up putting my students in groups of three. So I might have a group of three here, a group of three here, a group of three here. And my classes were about 20 to 25 students, typically. Yours may be more or less. But say I had seven groups of three. So yeah, something like that, whatever. And within each of these three groups, I would present a question. So for example, in economics, I might have asked the question, who should have control over health care? Or should the United States government um, regulate health care and health insurance. And students would then discuss within their little groups of three kind of informally how they feel about that topic. And then notice how I have my different groups kind of circled up here. One member of each group would then share out in a larger group discussion. So instead of having my whole class of 21 or 24 students discussing this topic all as a big whole group, kind of like Annalisa was, you know, warning us against. I only have eight students participating in this smaller group. And the other, you know, 16 or however many students are kind of on the background here. And what this does is it creates a safety net for the students that are participating in the inner circle discussion, if they kind of need a boost of confidence to kind of share their ideas, they can look back to their two shoulder partners back here for advice, for ideas before sharing into the smaller circle. 
And for me as a teacher, I would be somewhere back here. And as kind of Annalisa was talking about, I'm an active facilitator of this discussion, but active doesn't necessarily mean I'm talking a whole lot because I want my students to be the ones that are sharing their ideas. I don't want them to feel like I am telling them how to think, how to believe. I want them to feel like they have an open space to share their ideas and to let their peers kind of test whether or not those ideas hold water or not, because some peers might affirm the ideas, some peers might challenge the ideas. And letting the, the students do that among themselves is a really powerful tool because students are more willing to not feel like they're being influenced if their peers are the ones that are doing this. But at the same time, I'm still back here to make sure that students are not you know, dominating the conversation. One student isn't dominating too much the conversation. And also to make sure that if the conversation derails or if something disrespectful is said, I can then bring us back to the social contract, take a time out and bring us back together in the way that we should be operating. Um, and then at the end of this experience, I would end up going through three questions. So one, the, the students on the inner circle would then shift to the outer circle for the next two questions. That way, everyone has an opportunity to participate in the inner circle discussion. And then at the very end, I would have an exit ticket where students would simply just write a paragraph reflecting upon kind of what they took away from the discussion in terms of the big question I'm trying to ask. So if my question was, to what degree should government regulate healthcare, my students would end with the exit ticket, well, I think government should regulate healthcare by blah, 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 blah. And that way I can kind of just get a sense of, okay, did did this discussion work? Did it kind of get my students to kind of construct ideas in their heads? Other examples of this I've done, how should scarce resources be allocated by society, kind of comparing socialism, communism, uh, capitalism, um, who should control marijuana, looking at issues of federalism and government, and then should the presidential pardon power be limited, which was kind of a relevant controversial question in the last couple of years during the Trump administration. So I'm going to stop sharing, Jane, if you want to put the power or the slides back up, that would be awesome. Um, the other two, the other two reasons why I feel like having a community platform in your classroom is so important is so that you can establish a trust relationship and dive into, and so that you can dive into difficult history. So one thing that I had to tackle in my, you know, very rural, very conservative classroom was, do I teach about the 1619 project, which frames um, American history from the perspective of slavery and kind of centering slavery in the African American experience in American history. So I didn't want to ignore it altogether, but I, I the way I approached that was by saying, okay, you trust me that I'm not going to try to persuade you how to think. And I, because I've created that relationship in my classroom, but I brought the question to them should I teach the 1619 project? And I gave them information that they could use to tell me, yes, Mr. Wood, you should teach us about this, um, which is ultimately what they said. But what they ultimately came to the conclusion of is, yes, we should learn about the 1619 project, but in combination with other resources as well, kind of typing back to multiple perspectives, which I thought was a really powerful conclusion for my students to reach. And then building community is also really important because you have a pre-expected protocol and kind of an understanding as to how your classroom should operate should an impromptu discussion pop up or a disagreement pop up that you need to refer back to. So last year when I was teaching my junior senior government class, I was teaching about affirmative action and just describing for my students what affirmative action was because a lot of my students did not know what it was. And one of my students decided she wanted to start bringing the conversation into the George Floyd protests. And in, in that discussion, which really captured students, you know, attention and students wanted to talk about the George Floyd protests. So I kind of, um, so I wanted to make sure that we kind of took that teachable moment and ran with it. I 
one of the students said made the comment that she felt like the George Floyd protesters were acting like toddlers. And I had to take the time out there for a minute and say, OK, um, we're going to go back to our social contract. We're going to remind ourselves of the way that we share our feelings with one another, validating the experiences of other students, while at the same time, I don't want to make that student feel like her opinions were not valued, but I, I wanted her to have that safe space where she felt like she could share that, but I also wanted to challenge that kind of dialogue that she was engaging in as well and having that social contract I could refer back to really was a powerful tool for me because I could say we created this at the beginning of the year we decided that when we have discussions we're going to make sure that we're utilizing language that is respectful and acknowledges the different experiences that all of us as students share so I hope those are a few different ideas that you can use to kind of just solidify some of the things we're discussing here. Thank you so much, Al. That's always so insightful to hear kind of all the things, that, um, experiences that you've had in the classroom. Um, just being mindful of time, we're right at about an hour in, so I think this might be a good time to take a little bit of a five-minute break, and then let's say at 5.08 or so, um, we come back and, uh, and Annalisa will deep dive us into reasoning with democratic value. So um, see you all then in about five minutes. Amanda, are you able to um, stop the recording?